All right, everybody, welcome back to the Ridgeline Hunting Podcast, brought to you by Phelps Game Calls, professional game calls made for every hunter. And today we have um, the owner and founder of 6AM Outdoors, Tristan Talvey. Tristan, how's it going? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Happy to be here. (laughs) still breathing as they say right yeah definitely well today we're going to be talking about 6 a.m outdoors and all the products that they have um tristan do you want to um start off with the what your mission is with uh 6 a.m outdoors yeah i mean we're uh um manufacturer of lightweight outdoor gear we're just trying to provide you know, high quality outdoor gear that, you know, an average Joe can afford. Um, you get lightweight stuff mixed with quality stuff. It's always going to be expensive. Um, so we don't have, you know, a middleman, uh, we're, you know, direct to source. So you come on our website and, you know, we try to make a, a shelter or game bags that's affordable. Uh, it's all made here in the States, you know, lifetime warranty on the stuff. And you don't pay the, the high prices that you do at a big box store. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it, it's always good when you can um, knock out the middleman and go straight to people manufacturing the products. Yeah, I think, right. I think also, too, you know, something that's more affordable, that's high quality with lifetime warranties, valuable. Because you're, right. I mean, we have a ton of expenses, you know, so yeah. if you're going on a trip and, you know, as Dave and I did this last weekend, uh, we were we were turkey hunting, and um, it was down in the 30s at night. But um, you know, we had a nice setup. But if you don't have that setup, then you're gonna freeze. And you know, I woke up that first night pretty cold. But it's nice to know that there's another option that's you know affordable too. So people that don't know about 6 a.m., you know, they can check out the website and get something direct from Tristan. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we've got everything, you know, like storage pouches, you know, shelters, quilts, game bags, you know, accessories, um, you know, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but, you know, it's everybody's seen this model, business model before, and the real company that set it aside was Kuyu. You know, you all seen that. Yeah, um, yeah. Direct to consumer. Um, but, you know, the big thing was is everybody uh, wanted to, to save money, so they kept it in-house. Um you know, so as in they don't have a middleman, you know, a retailer. Uh, but once they, they ship their stuff overseas, you know, you still saw the same prices. And, you know, that's what, what bothers me about, you know, that business model. Um, you try to keep it affordable, but if you're sending stuff overseas, you know, the labor is cheaper. So, yeah, it's still affordable, but it's, you're not, you know, you're collecting more profits, but you're not passing that on. So your margins, you know, increase, which is good for business, but you're not giving the tech typically higher quality to your consumers, you know? So that's where we always focus on keeping everything in the States because it's helping, you know, the economy, you know, the American people. So we're not trying to get stuff overseas and push that way. Um, Yeah, we could do that. You know, it'd be so much cheaper, especially with, you know, uh, we're in Bozeman, Montana here, and they're they're hiring, you know, cash register or not even cash registers because they're all self checkout now. But Walmart workers for like twenty three bucks an hour, and our our minimum wage out here is eight and some change, you know. So wow. it's just crazy labor costs. Um, but yeah, so we just keep everything in the states. You know, we have contract sewers uh, because we do batches of game bags at a time or stuff sacks. Um, we call our G3s, yeah, but those G3s you know, I can't keep, fantastic. yeah, I can't keep up with that stuff. Um, when I first started, I used to do it all. And, you know, now I'm at the point where, you know, business is good. You know, we're growing or we've been growing because we've been doing this since officially as a business since 15. But, you know, I, I have a, a full-time job. I'm a finance manager by, by trade, I would call it, I guess. Um, this is more of a, a hobby and a side gig to get me to interact with, you know, people like yourself or you go to trade shows and you talk to them because if you're in a, in a high rise, you know, talking finance and numbers, you know, they're 
typically not the outdoorsy hunter person. So <laughs> it's a, that's that's my avenue. Yeah, you got to have that little outlet. <laughs> Hey, that's, hey that's Tristan, it. I'm right there with you, man. I work for a credit union here in Washington, so um, this podcast is actually helping me talk hunting. So <laughs> at that's, work, I don't get to do that, and this is my outlet. <laughs> well, that's that's how it is, you know. I went into the high rise where you know I I work, and you sit there and you're in your little cubicle. You know, I don't even, it's not even a 10 by 10. It's got to be like a six by six, maybe eight by eight, maybe. <laughs> and, and, and and you're sitting there and you're typing away. And next thing you hear, you're like, you know, I'm like, what the heck? And it's like, you know, no, no offense to anybody listening or anybody, but it's like they're, they're, they're guys that are putting lotion on. And it's like, what the, what the heck? You know, and here I am all rough with calluses, you know, it's like clear, clearly that guy doesn't fit in here. It's like, yeah, like that Brad Paisley song, you know, with lotion on your hands, you can't grip a tackle box. That's uh, that's it. So yeah, when I'm in the in the business aspect, you know, it's I'm out of place. But this is you know the avenue of where you know I get to talk about what I love, the things that I do. Um, you know, I don't even know how many days I was in the field last year. I mean, I was in town for about a week and then I was gone for about 10 days and I did that for about three months. And, and that was, it took a toll on me, you know, I just, you know, I got two kids, a wife, you know, we all have family lives and as we all love hunting in the outdoors, but when you're gone from your family and I I got a six and a nine or seven, yeah, about to be a seven, but six and a nine year old. And, you know, you miss those things. And, you know, you, you just get back to town and next thing you know, it, you're catching up on work and it's 10 hour days. It seems like to get back up to snuff and then you're gone again. But, you know, my buddy, he drew a moose permit and then, you know, I was elk hunting and then it was deer hunting. And then we were going to do a, his bike. He, same dude drew a moose permit in Alaska. and He also drew a bison permit. Um, so I, we actually pushed that out till March and we just got back from that. You should have him uh, well, sprinkle should. some of that dust on you. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's, uh, super, that's good uh, luck there, man. <laughs> uh, I'm not that lucky. And, <laughs> you know, we we started going in to apply. So just for you guys, if you didn't know, or your listeners, you know, Alaska is a no-point state. So if, let's say, you guys have been doing it for, you know, two years, and I've been doing it for 30, we all got the same odds. You know, an example is New Mexico. New Mexico does that as well. Um, now there was some changes within New Mexico about like the hunter, you know, the resident pool and outfitter pool and all that stuff. But Alaska doesn't have that. And his dad, uh, my buddy Adam, his dad lives up in Kenai, and he's like, "You guys should apply for you know special draws, not just the over counter stuff, but special draws." And you know, I talked to Adam about it and I'm like, what are we going to do? You know, and his dad would give us some, some hunt codes of what we're going to put in for. And we start talking about it. I'm like, Hey, let's put in, you know, whatever. Um, you know, cause I usually hunt Alaska once a year and they require, you know, a license to apply. So I, and I think that's 160 bucks. So if you think about it, it's 160 bucks to even start to apply. But when we were looking at these species, it's bison, muskox, moose, and caribou. And, you know, they do a party tag too. What, like Montana, for example, if you guys, we like all that. three of us were on a, you guys do part, party, party tag in Montana? No, uh, no, we for have Washington party. state. Yeah. Washington state has a, they call okay. it a group hunt, but, um, you know, there's a group leader and then whoever's in the group, if, uh, all your points go into the group leader for that draw. And if you get drawn, okay. everybody gets a tag for that permit or whatever it is. But they don't do it for you know sheep or moose or it's, it's yeah you just can't do it elk, for any of the basically elk and lifetime ones. Got it. Yeah, that's how Montana uh, Montana is as well. Do you guys know if Washington, if you guys get if you're all on one ticket, or do you guys get your own ticket with everybody's information on it? I I, I haven't drawn it, so I don't know. But <laughs> okay, uh, I know that the group tag. Um, when you get your your tag, um, it'll have some pr- sort of credential on it, you know. So uh, it'll say whatever you have, you know. But I think as the as your, I don't think they detail it that far because if you get a moose or get the special elk permit for, say it's Bethel Ridge, right, and you draw that 
as a group, then everybody would get a tag for Bethel Ridge. Yep. It would just say you know, Elk Bethel Ridge. And if you have that tag with your name on it, it doesn't, you could hunt separate from those people. It wouldn't matter. So they, yeah. don't, they don't identify the group. Right. And that's how Montana is, you know, because I, I had, uh, I had some friends that wanted to hunt Montana from Washington and I told them, you know, do the group hunt. The party hunt is what Montana calls it. Mm-hmm. But I told them to do that is because Montana, like if we, all three of us went on it, we would all have three tickets in the hat and we'd all have our names on it. So you technically have three tickets in a hat with all three of our names on it. So you have good odds rather than just, you know, one person doing it by themselves. So, you know, if you got three people, you got three tickets versus one person coming out solo. And same scenario, you're not obligated to hunt with them. It just gets you the tag. And, of course, everybody that I told to do that, they drew it. You know, so <laughs> great for them. But they, they all were able to come out to hunt. So that was super cool. But Alaska, you know, they do, um, I, I don't know, but it's not Montana style. It's one ticket. So if you've got a party of six people, you're all on one ticket. So everybody, oh. those six people, are waiting for that one ticket to get drawn. And I told Adam, I said, you know, bison and moose, they're just too big of an animal. You know, if we get drawn for a party, we wouldn't be able to do it. You know, we would kill ourselves literally. And, and so we did do party. We did party on caribou and muskox. And of course, when draws came out, you know, I, my buddy told me, he, he's like, he called me and he goes, Hey, I drew a, I drew a moose permit. And we, we did the math, you know, beforehand, and it was about 12% chance of drawing. And I'm like, oh, dude, right on, you know, sweet. He's like, and I drew my bison. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. like 0% chance so, of <laughs> That is hilarious. Yes. So, and I, we just got back from that in March. And uh, so, sorry, but needless to say, cut the story short, I didn't draw anything. Well, so, I. Did your but, buddy score on either of those tags? Yeah, so we went up in September, um, and it was uh, a hunt um, north of Fairbanks. And, you know, we saw moose. We were probably a, a week to 10 days early. You know, the bulls were were separated from the cows. And, you know, it's just very tough. You know, it's kind of I, – I, I don't want to say it's kind of my fault because it wasn't my tag to do the due diligence to make sure I knew exactly what to do. But knowing this person that I hunt with, I should have done more because, you know, he's the type of person, you know, like a bison hunt. He showed up to pull the trigger and, you know, that was it, Yeah. you know, but he, he builds custom homes. He doesn't have time, but you know, on the moose, we were there. We saw, we saw some bulls. Um, when we were, we were calling and you have to have patience with moose and we, none of us never hunted moose before. And, you know, we all have hunted elk and you sit there and you call and you move until you hear a a response and then you make a game plan. Well, moose hunting isn't like that. You call and you play cards or you call and you take a nap or read a book, you know, (laughs) because (laughs) <laughs> because there's there's so few moose and you're calling in this area that's really typically thick and those moose are very very curious animals and if you're not in the rut they'll hear you and what's you talk to anybody who moose hunts and they're like once you call it and you know you're like you're calling them back they will pin, they will pinpoint you to the tree they could be at over a mile away and they know exactly where you're at. And the words of advice that I got, um, you know, after this hunt, they said that it could take two days, you know, for a moose to show up. And the hard part was, is it's, that's so boring, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. like che- it's chasing elk, you know, you, you go out there, you call, you rub and you wait for that bugle. But when you're sitting there and you're doing this bellow for a moose and nothing happens and you're doing that for a week on end and not hearing or seeing anything, man, our spirits were so low, but yeah. So we called and called and called and, but we were too mobile. And of course, sure, sure enough, some of the spots that we were calling at, we came back and there was moose dead. 
You know, oh. so two spots, somebody shot two separate moves. You guys probably got um, them in for them then. I, I, I can't say for a hundred percent certain, <laughs> but I could I, I could say for ninety eight percent certain because I, it was right in the same area where we were calling. I take the credit, man. So I'm going through your Instagram here and looking at I'm looking at this bison here. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty impressive, man. It's awesome. Uh, but I also see, you know, there's some turkey on here. There's different shelters you have in place. And then you have these sportsman shows. It looks like you're doing, um, this is in Montana, I think. This is a Western Hunt Expo. Not to change the, the, the um, topic, but, um, you know, looking at this stuff, I see there, there's a there's a stove in these tents, too. Like you have a stove jack. Yeah. Like a little... y- yep. So all of our shelters have the ability to add a stove jack to them. Um, the big thing is, is that the stove jacks are, excuse me, not stove jacks, the stoves are two pounds. Mm-hmm. So like, for example, if you're looking at um, our Madison TV, it's one pound, 12 ounces, you know, for that shelter. And it's nine and a half foot square, six and a half feet tall. So that's the big thing is if you think about it, you got a shelter and a stove and you're sub four pounds. So if you're, if you're like me, you're just starting into lightweight shelters, what, what, what would you recommend people start at? Like what would your, what would you say? This is going to get you started. You're going to figure out what you like, and this is going to protect you three seasons. The big thing that I would say is figure out what you, what you want. The big thing is, let's say if we look at our four corners or a bitter, they're almost identical shelters. One just has a, re, a removable door on one end. That's the bitter root. The four corners has removable on both ends. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I bring that up is because it's long. So it's the main body is eight feet long. So it's plenty for you to lay down, but it's four feet tall. So a lot of people want space to stand up. So if that is a key component that you want to stand up in, well, then it's going to be a teepee because that's six and a half feet tall. Okay. Um, and if you, you know, so that would be the first starting point to think about. Because really weight isn't, you know, a big key factor at that point. Because if you decide a shelter you want to go which way, well, then you've got the, the fabric options uh, with the exception of the teepees because they're so big. Uh, the four corners, for example, you've got a 1.9 ounce. All of our shelters are 1.9 ounce uh, rift stop nylon. They've got a urethane coating, so they're all waterproof. Um, and they also have a 1.1 ounce silk poly. Um, the silk poly is roughly half the weight of the 1.9 ounce. And the reason why is because the silk poly is a 20 denier versus the 1.9, which is 70 denier. So the 70 denier, think about it as, you know, we all know about gauge of wire. So mm-hmm. it's, let's say it's, it's thicker gauge of fabric, of, of thread. Mm-hmm. So it's more of a robust or stout fabric, which adds, adds weight. So. First thing would be is to figure out if you want to stand up, you want to sit up, all of them you can sit up in. Um, the CC divide has a little bit more room up front, you know, so if you're conversing with your hunting partner, uh, you would be concentrated towards the front. Uh, if you're in a bitter root or a four corners, it's equidistant, so it's it's going to be uh, four foot tall. So you can still sit up in it and your buddy could be at the opposite end of the shelter, so you're not face to face. Um, and then a teepee, you know, at six and a half feet tall. Now me, um, I use all of them primarily. Uh, I use the four corners because it's the main body by itself in early seasons, right at one pound. And then if I go into late season, I can bring my doors and add seven ounces. So it's one pound, seven ounces. I don't need 81 square feet, 81 plus square feet of a, of a teepee because it's, you know, nine and a half square foot. Mm -hmm. I don't need that. I don't need to stand up because in reality, when are we all going to stand up? We don't just stand up and converse in the shelter. Well, it's nice to put your, to put I like your clothes on. I like to get back on. to camp and lay down is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> At the end that's, of the day, I'm like, that's man, ins- I just want to lay down here. <laughs> yeah. The first thing in of order is take off your boots, right? Yeah. So, so that's what we all do is we take off our boots and we lay down and we start boiling our water for food. You know, typically that's what everybody does. Yeah. Um, the great thing about a teepee is if you stand up to put your clothes on, but I don't have any issues putting my pants on when I'm laying down. Yeah. Um, but some people like to stand up. So, yeah. um, 
that's that's an option. No, they're both they're both great options. I'm just kind of making a joke about you know at the end of the day when you get to the camp. That's it for me, man. <laughs> yes, Dave. I, I as soon as I lay down, I'm I'm out. You know, two two to ten seconds. You got you know only eight second window in there, but it doesn't take right. much for me. Yeah, he, he his head hits the pillow and he's out. I'm like, dang, man. I wish I had that superpower. I I I can't do that. <laughs> Yeah, tell me where to get that. <laughs> yeah, you got you to gotta be in construction, apparently. <laughs> I, I am, yeah, I am not like that. I was in construction, and I still wasn't like that. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it yeah. is for me, fortunately. But, yeah, this that's last weekend, we were, we were out, and, um, you know, we were talking about, we, we brought a little Mr. Buddy heater with us, and that kept it pretty warm in there, what was on, but we were talking about uh, the difference between you know, three season and four season tents. Um, do you have those options or, or is it, is it all pretty much? Um, I mean, it's, I don't know. I don't know. I've seen some tents that have like an inner wall and an outer wall um, in some, some variation, but I'm just curious if you guys have that or if it's all, you know, lightweight and then stove jack for heat and just keep it going. That's exactly it. So it's just a main shelter. So it's kind of all a cart. So if you wanted to come in and, with the exception of, let's say, the TP, uh, because the TP is you buy it and you're done. Uh, the four corners or the bitter root, you have the choice. It's all a cart. You want to buy the, shell, the the main body. You want to add the doors. Do you want to add a stove jack? Do you want to add a floor? So you build the system that you want. Okay. Um, if you're if you're never going to be using a stove jack, then you don't have to pay for the stove jack. Um, the TP uh, is the only exception is it comes with a stove jack reason being is i have a lot more people that just want to buy a tp and go so it's so much easier just to have it done and it's packaged ready to rock and roll so when someone orders it i just grab it out of our inventory and ship it otherwise i would have to go and pull it out sew a stove jack in and then ship it so the end goal is to have a, a product to the end consumer as fast as possible. Um, and I'm, I'm having a hard time with the four corners and the bitter root, for example, because I don't know what somebody wants to order. Mm-hmm. So that com- comes down to inventory. And when you're sewing something together, um, it's always nice to have the same exact dimensions. You know, for example, it's 50 inches. But if you roll a ham, it might be 49 and three quarters. Well, if you take away that quarter of an inch, the zippers might not line up if I was to keep zipper or the, the hatches separate. So if somebody wants to add them, I just go grab from a hatch bin and put it with the kit. It, it doesn't really work that well because it's not a robot making this thing. Yeah. You know, it's an actual human being. There's a margin of error. Mm-hmm not really error, but, you know, measurement, I would guess I'd call it. Yeah, but, there's, there's unique differences between each one that are small perfect, because per, of their handmade. Perfect explanation. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect, perfect explanation. So what we do is, you know, in those scenarios online, I have a uh, setup where you can go in there and say, okay, I want the four corners with the stove, with, you know, the, the hatch and all those things where, on my end on inventory, I keep a complete one option available. Mm-hmm. And if somebody wants one, which is very unlikely because you get so many people who would order a shelter without a stove jack and they realize, wow, this thing is light. I can add a stove to this for two pounds. And I'm still under my old weight and now I have heat. Um, I had a lot of people sending their um, hatch back to add a stove jack. Not a problem. There's no additional costs more than what you would pay at checkout, but it's just so much easier for the end user just to buy it with a stove jack and be done with it. A a stove jack's 50 bucks. So I think from a consumer standpoint, you know, that being me, I would probably just prefer to have the option already there. Yeah, definitely. I may may never buy a stove, but but you want the option. Well, yeah, it, well, it spurs you into thinking like, 
now I have the capability of buying a stove where you may never get one if you're like, I got to send my tent in, then I got to get this thing done. And then, you know, right. now I can get a stove. But if I'm looking at that stove jack and I'm cold in the middle of the night, <laughs> you know what I'm doing when I get back? <laughs> yep. Yep. Personally, 100%. Just, yep. I, yep. I, and I like and the, the modularity, you know, where the seasons can form different or the tents can form to different seasons, you know, based on yep. addition or subtraction of parts. And so that's nice too, because you don't have to have like a, three season tent and then a four season tent and then one without a jack and you know it's become a lot of gear you know yeah i have i have a gear overload you know i'm gonna start i'm gonna have to start getting rid of some stuff but i hate that right yeah and if you know for your example if you know for you if you ordered a shelter with a stove jack we don't cut out the hole in it so you're not gonna have to worry about uh, a huge draft or not um when you're ready we have a video out there that shows you how to cut out a stove jack it was really simple. Um, you pretty much just put a circle on it, you know, like the size of uh, the interior size of a, like the blue masking tape. Mm -hmm. And then you, you do the little lines like a pizza and you just cut out the lines. Don't cut out the circle part. So there's the flaps that are still there. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, when you put your stove jack in it, it's the, those little pieces fold in, which actually creates a, it soaks up that air gap. So, it's, that's all you do to cut it. Um, so we do not do that because if you don't buy a stove, we don't want you to have a hole in your in your stove jack if you're not going to be using it. And then when you're ready, then you just cut a hole in it or cut the slits in it. You're not cutting out the whole fabric. Now, is that stove jack, what is that? Is that made of silicone or what is that? No, so a lot of people are using the fiberglass silicone. Um, that actually is a little bit more weight compared to what we use so we use nomex mm -hmm. nomex is actually more fire retardant than like firemen or nascar suits mm -hmm. so um a lot of nascar suits um have components of nomex but that's what we use so it's actually a fire retardant material yeah i have experience with the nomex um you know back in the day i was volunteering as a firefighter and our hoods were all nomex so yep um you know our hoods we put on when, after we'd put on our b our BAs, our breathing apparatus, we'd have to put this Nomex hood around and create a seal around the gasket. But yeah, those, those little Nomex hoods, they're, they're you can't even burn them, you know? So, yep. um, you know, that, that's good to know that it's something that's not going to melt. That's, you know, fire, um, basically proof and, uh, going to last. Yep. And that, and that we, the funny thing is you said it doesn't burn, you know, the funny thing is with fabrics, it is a fabric mm -hmm. and it's, it's a woven fabric. So if you think of a ripstop nylon, you got these square grids, all these horizontal and vertical lines. When you cut them, you're going to get these little frays, you know, cause uh, that little thread undoes comes undone, but you know, it's sewn in and all, but you'll see them there. And I always try to touch them up, you know, because you don't want to see a fray, but, <laughs> like you said, it, it it doesn't burn, so you can't you can't really you can't really clean it up, you know. But you That's know, funny. it's on the inside. You don't see it unless you're you know in the inside staring out. But if you're on the outside, it looks perfectly clean. So yeah, you know, I just thought it was funny. Like yeah, it doesn't burn. You just get the scissors and trim it up, you know. <laughs> yeah, Go that's all wife, you can do. The wife's makeup bag probably has something in it, you know, a little tiny eyelash scissor or something. You, know, you can do yep. that no problem. That's interesting. Yep. That's interesting. But I do like, I do like the, op I don't even, I don't even know if I like the option. I'd rather just have it be there for myself. You know, right. You know, if the reasons I explained, cause that it's easier for me just to order, like, I'm like sitting here going, dang, it's cold. Wish I had a stove. Get online. Boom. Yeah. I just ordered a stove. But not only that, let's say like, you know, that year, like, okay, I'm going to get a shelter, but I can't afford the, the stove right now. I'm going to get it next year. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, what, you know, whenever, you know, you still have that option, like, well, I can get this now and then I can get the stove later, you know, or you can just go all in and get it all at once. You know what I do? I always try to, you know, I always, I always try to like figure out some little scenario. I'm like, I'm going to order this tent. You know, I know I want the stove. So I'm just going to tell everybody I'm going to order it like by the time my birthday comes. So I'm ordering the tent in November. Everybody pitch in on the stove in December. Bam. Done right there. <laughs> yeah, Christmas me, you know? present. Yep. I always, I always do it for my birthday or, you know, I actually try to tag team because I'm born in December close to Christmas. So it's kind of like, you know, discount price for everybody on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what's the, up with this? <laughs> no love. The, the cool thing, though, too, is, you know, we actually just keep partnered with 
uh, Affirm and Cordova. Mm-hmm. So they're both finance options, you know, and 0% finance. So we haven't done it in a full season yet. So we're probably four months in and we've seen a huge uptick in sales because if we think about it, these are, they're, they're big purchases, but they're not big purchases as in like my competitors, Mm -hmm. but it's, it makes it affordable to an end user. You know, for example, if somebody wants to buy a a Madison TP, that's 570 bucks, Mm -hmm. the whole shebang with a stove, a carbon fiber pole that weighs six ounces, you know, is like 950 bucks. So it gives them the opportunity to technically finance this thing. Uh, and, and, you know, there's obviously different, you know, payment plans and how, how the duration. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's up to the end, end user, but it's in 0% interest. So for those people who, and and not saying to do this, but if you want to, we're like, hey, I need a shelter. I'm going on a hunt. You can buy a shelter. You finance it for that month, and then you sell it when you get back. You know, third party. I, you could do that. Mm-hmm. Not saying that's the best option, but that that gives somebody the opportunity to get out in a, in, in a shelter and have a stove. Or if somebody's on the fence about buying a stove, oh, I'll buy one later. Well, now you're only financing. 250 bucks more than what you originally anticipated, you know, spread out between four, six, eight, whatever months, Mm -hmm. you know, it makes it so much more affordable to people and we've never done it. So it's going to, I'm going to be amazed hopefully of what it's going to bring for the business, you know, come busy season. How did you, uh, because how did you, how did you get, how did you get linked up with this affirm in in Cordova? Cause um, my, my, what piqued my interest is, like a lot of people say it's 0% interest, right? And mm-hmm. that to me is, I mean, it's free money for one. For two, it's the same as paying cash. So you, it's not costing you any more to buy this than if you were to plop down, say it's 500 bucks, you pay 500 bucks, or you pay 50 bucks for 10 months or whatever the term is. It's going to cost you the same amount either way. So it's basically right. it's yeah. basically same as cash. Yeah. So even if you wanted, like you're buying your license, you got John for a hunt, you go ahead and you, you're like, man, I got to spend $2,000 on tax. I got airfare and I got to have lodging. I need a freaking tent. It's got to be lightweight. Dang, man, this budget's really just getting blown up bigger and bigger. You could you could do that. It's nice that they do that at firm. I wish they would do it with hunting tags. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're going to get me next year too, so you might as well just put me on a 12-month plan, you know? <laughs> right. Payroll yeah, deduction. so uh, I got in with a firm, one of my buddies, uh, his name is Thomas, and he sells um, Batku e-bikes. Mm-hmm. And we know Thomas. Batku, great. So, Thomas, you know, if you're selling those bikes, they're easy five grand, you know, for like a storm model. And you got to think, well, here I am trying to sell somebody a full-blown shelter for a thousand bucks, but they're trying to sell a $5,000 bike. So a firm was brought out and he told me about it. And I was just like, yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah. And finally I just said, you know what? That's a great idea. I should do that. So I did that. I had a firm for probably two to three months and I was seeing sales, but we were at the hunt expo there in salt Lake. And a gentleman came up, talked to me about Cordova and I've never heard of him. And I said, Oh, so you're just a competitor to a firm. He's like, yeah. He's like, but does a firm actually support the outdoor industry? I'm like, uh, geez, I don't know. You know, but uh, apparently Cordova, they do everything in the outdoors. And then he was like, yeah, and we also give a, a good discount to the Bozeman guys. You know, so they just moved into Bozeman. <laughs> Hometown discount. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, it, that's exactly what he said. And uh, apparently Cordova has huge requirements from a business side, you know, to be able to be accepted by Cordova. Mm-hmm. And he told me those and I was like, dude, I don't meet those thresholds. You know, I don't remember. It was a sales threshold. Mm-hmm. I'm like, dude, I don't need those numbers. He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. You're, you, we got the Bozeman discount and no joke. That's what he said. Yeah. <laughs> so he got me squared away and I'm set up on Cordova now. So I do have both options on there. So, you know, whoever does apply, they can apply for both. And, 
Some may give better rates. I know that Cordova actually uses all three mm-hmm. credit rating agencies. Rather, I think a firm only uses two. So you get a better rate through Cordova. So, so yeah, the zero, I mean, it's going to depend on your credit, you know. But ab- absolutely. Zero yep. percent is definitely an option if you've been, you know, trustworthy in the past. They, they believe they're going to get their money back. You know, they're not, yep. they're not worried about it. But yeah, I mean that sure. that option to me is highly attractive. You know, I'm yep. sitting here looking. I mean, at I've, I'm like, man, you know, that's I see these little signs on people's things saying affirm, and I'm like, I'm not gonna. You know, there's other companies that have it out there, and I'm like, I'm not gonna do that thing. I'm like, Why would I finance this thing right here? I'll just wait till I have all the money. I got fifty bucks in my pocket, you know, <laughs> so I'm good for thirty days. Give me again, you know. Yep, I can do that, yeah. and, uh, and I think that's awesome. Yeah, and a lot of people are doing that because I'm the same way with like you. You know, you see them all. I don't do them. You know, I, I would. I'm just diligent enough with a finance background that if I don't have the money, I don't buy it. Mm-hmm. You know, and and that's just me personally. But on the business side, you have to have. I think it's over fifty bucks is what you can. Anything over fifty bucks is you could put out on a payment plan. So if you think about it. You know, our G3 is a storage stack. A five pack is 56 bucks. You can put that on a payment plan. You know, your game bags, for, you know, or a quilt, you know. So I've seen all of those items, even shelters, you know, almost all of our products that is greater than 50 bucks. I've seen it put on um, a payment plan, which, yeah. you know, is, is, is two folds, right? It's good for a consumer because they don't have to throw up all the cash right now. And good for a business standpoint because you get the sale. Yeah, I know that if I, so if I buy something for $500 that's, you know, outdoor related, it's usually um, kind of kept secret, you know, because I don't want my wife to know about it. I'm like, hey, <laughs> I didn't spend 500 bucks on this thing. You know, there's that famous TikTok thing. How much did this cost? They gave it to me. No, how much was yeah. it? Like 30 bucks, you know, <laughs> it's only like 50 bucks a month. I don't have to, I don't have to spend the 500. You know, I think it would be a convenience factor, you know, um, definitely serves your, your clientele and gives them options. Cause you know, it's a long, it's a long year between seasons. And so maybe you don't have to have the tent now, but you could say, Hey, I could have this tent order in January. And then by the time season comes around, it's paid off. I'm ready to go. I got that other bullet coming around the corner with my tag fees and, you know, maybe I get a bow or something or whatever else you got to buy. So it kind of, it lessens that blow that you otherwise would normally absorb and be like, geez, I just spent a ton of money. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so I can and see the, and using it as a tool that way. You know, even if you had the money and you're like, oh, I'll just pay for it. You could strategize if it's 0%. I, I don't see any reason if at 0%, you know, cause I mean, that's, 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 you know, same as cash. That's right. And the big thing is, is, you know, our hunting seasons are, uh, I would just say ours as in general, because Montana is very attractive on hunting seasons, but you know, it's August till February, you know, most States are August till October, maybe, mm-hmm. you know, I know Washington has late season too, but it, it pretty much stops for most States. Uh, I would like to think, you know, after, th- after Thanksgiving time ish. Mm-hmm. So you got to think is that's Christmas and Christmas is big with families. And then it's New Year, and and then it's next thing you know, it's tax season, you know, and oh, now you got a rebate, you know. So there's a lot of things that happen outside of hunting season, um, that it's it puts that stuff on the back burner. Like, oh, I need a new shelter. I'll wait till next year. Well, when they say that, well, now it's Thanksgiving, and then they got Black Friday, you know, where the wife goes out shopping or. Cyber Monday, and then it's Christmas, you know, and then, oh, it's New Year's. You know, there's always something that comes up. He's going to put on the back burner every time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then before you know it, uh, you might get your tax refund in March, April, something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, depend, depending on when you file. But if you're waiting the last minute, you're not getting it till May, June, and then it's hunt season again. You know, so those people who wait for a tax return, they really don't have the time because you know, it's June or July and they could be using it that month. So I hope, I think that this would open up the door to those people. You know, the example that you just mentioned, it's same as cash. Buy it now for 50 bucks and 
you're, you're, it's paid off in, you know, 10, 12 months, you know, or whatever term you choose. Mm -hmm. And you've got the product and you're ready to rock and roll. Because that's what really gets me is, you know, we're a small business. These things aren't something that's CNC cut where a robot does it, you know. You, you have to have someone behind a sew machine to sew it up. And when you get a lot of people ordering, it just gets in between, you know, in, in line. Mm -hmm. So you're, you would be behind somebody waiting for your product. Um, and we try to always get our product out within, you know, two weeks, so 10 business days. Wonderful. And it really is salt in my wounds when it's longer. Wonderful. So that's, that's why I, oh, sorry, go ahead. It's hard to know when, 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 there's a pause, you know, we, we had, <laughs> me and Dave were talking about that the other day, but, um, while you're on the subject that the one thing for me, like when I purchase something, it's usually like last minute, I'm like, Oh crap, I need to get this. And so last minute I buy something and then I don't have time to fiddle with it. And I'm in the truck on the way to where we're going, trying to figure out how does this thing work, you know? And so another, you know, I'm just extrapolating to myself, like, how can I use this to my advantage? Well, it gives you time to fiddle with it in your yard. You can set it up, take it down use the stove you know see how it all sit, fits together you know then you can get an idea too how you're going to perform in the field you know those are those are just my ideas because um you know i'm the guy that's a last minute you know, a lot of times yep and that's it you know you already mentioned it your stove your stove you, you know you don't have to but it's it's great to have a break in before you're out in the field trying to wrestle with it mm -hmm. or a shelter you know you got to set it up to seam seal it so you know you want to know how to set it up when you're at, you know at home so you have time to you know so you're not pressed or anything um so yeah to that to your point is it's great to to try it out and make sure you got it you know your eyes dotted your t's crossed and so forth and you know every year is always the same you always get people who order something that want it tomorrow that it's custom ordered and they don't understand, you know, that mm -hmm. it's custom ordered stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm trying to be better on the business side where I have items stocked. So if you guys take a look at the website, you know, if you if you follow the business since when we first started, all of our stuff was pretty much custom order. Yeah. And na now I have the like R our quilts. RTS. Yeah, that's exactly it. They're ready to ship. Mm -hmm. So that's what RTS is, you know. So our quilts were all custom ordered. Now it's, um, I'm, I've got three different color options, and there's uh, three different sizes. There's a, a regular long and extra long, and they all come in, like I said, three different sizes. So if we think about it, that's nine different variations that I have to keep on hand. And, you know, when you first start out a business, it takes money to make a product. And that's the problem that it got me, you know, starting out is, you know, those nine items cost X amount of dollars. Well, that's just inventory sitting on the shelf. And, you know, as some a business starting out, you don't have extra money just to sit on a shelf. Yeah. So with the business standpoint I am now, I think this started in 2020. Um, I'm, I'm going further and further away of custom stuff and going more towards ready to ship because I, I, I want people to get a product as fast as possible because they want to use the product. You know, they got a hunt coming up maybe next week because they waited last minute or maybe they just found out about a hunt, you know, that was spur of the moment kind of a deal, you know, an outfitter had an opening or something. Mm -hmm. But those are the things where I'm trying to better the business at stocking inventory i'm not talking game bags or g3s or multi-cloths because those are all mass produced items but big ticket items like your shelters your quilts those are the items that i'm trying to have a stock on because it helps the end user get their product faster mm -hmm. and that's what i want to do so you know the, the people who really want a lime green and a blue quilt well yeah they're going to have to wait a little bit because that's a custom made product but somebody who does not care and uh, are, are ready to ship stuff are 10 degree quilts because that's the number one seller, like five to one. Um, you know, all those things are ready to ship. So you order it, it's shipped the next day. Awesome. I got a question for you. <clears throat> um, 
I'm looking at the website here and I see this coffee. This dark timber yep. coffee vapor pack. Yep. What is what is that? I mean, I know so, it's coffee, but Yeah. So Dark Timber is owned by Tony. And Tony was in Washington and he recently moved to Ennis, Montana. So he is actually a coffee roaster. Um, he's, uh, he's got a huge resume of roasting coffee. Um, and you know, when you're in the outdoor world and small business, uh, you try to help one another out and that's what I do with Tony. Um, you know, so Tony is a local coffee roaster and your, your vapor pack, um, you know, there's a vapor pack, there's an ascent pack, there's a gravity pack. Um, and so there's, that's just some of his lines Mm -hmm. and, coffee right now and he would be a better person to answer this obviously because it's his business but coffee is going the cost of coffee is going through the roof Mm -hmm. and um it's it's uh uh a luxury item call it you know to have a customer of coffee when you can go get a Folgers you know or buy a bag of coffee from the grocery grocery store right so Tony is seeing a huge hit on from dark timber because of the state of the economy you know people the uncertainty or you know inflation you know those types of things Mm. so i told tony i said give me some product here i'm not even going to chart you know take a cut or anything Mm. you know just give me give me some stuff i can put on the site where if a customer comes to me and they order some stuff they're like oh yeah i need some coffee then that helps tony out so that's what i'm doing to uh to help Tony um, potentially help him generate some extra sales. I like that because we this last weekend I had uh, this little I can't even remember what it's called, but it's um, it's a cafe caffaretti percolator, little tiny one, mm-hmm. and I'd use that on top of the jet boil, and you know it makes a cup of coffee. But these instant packs and it looks like the gravity pack, you just pour your water and it comes out to a wheat system or something. But you know the instant coffee solution. We were talking about that. We were like, man, we need to get some of those little packets, you know? So yep. seeing that on here is making yep. the coffee, you know, easier, you know, time saving. Cause you know, in the morning, well, at least for us, we're in a hurry to mm-hmm. try to get boots on the ground and start going after, you know, critters. So we're trying to get breakfast going or trying to get coffee going. And we're, you know, on a time crunch to get this stuff done. And, you know, we're just sitting there waiting for this coffee. It's like, yeah. oh my gosh. <laughs> literally watching water boil but <laughs> i yep. think it's 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 part of the day you know and that's just simplifying it even further having that plus you're supporting the outdoor industry and and the fellow outdoorsmen and so that's that's good to know because i mean i i do buy quite a bit of coffee and various manufacturers of it but um you know yep. if i'm going hunting um i'm going to support the hunter you know or the or the hunting industry so i'll buy you know the dark timber when i'm hunting and when i'm at home i won't use the instant pack as much probably but I'll use the beans, right? you know? So yep. I do grind my own beans and all that stuff. And I have different ways I make it, you know, depending on how I feel or how much time I have, but I do, I do enjoy coffee a lot. And that, that's cool to see that on there. Um, then uh, I was looking at, you have these, these, uh, what is that right there? So Tristan, G3. we're three, we're, we're taking a look at all your um, new products here on the website. Um, sure. Is there anything that you, um, you know, your top seller for some of these new products. Cause there's the bighorn reed stash. That one's not, not very new, but, um, right. You had that this weekend too. I saw that. Yeah. I, I used that. I was, I was wondering if you knew we were turkey hunting cause you had all the milk calls in there. Dude, it just doesn't go <laughs> off the pack. It just stays on the pack. I don't know. Take it off. You never yeah, know. I don't recall. You never I don't know recall what, cow call it what product. I don't know what products are still on. There's the multi cloth product. 2.0. There's the G3s, but in orange. So there's like, there's like orange and black and tan and. Yeah. What is the multi cloth? So we have two different versions. One of them is out of stock with no ETA yet, and that is the multi cloth 2.0. So a multi cloth is a four by six cloth of fabric. The 2.0 is breathable, so it does not have a coating on it except for DWR. Um, and then the WP is a waterproof version. So a four by six cloth could be used for a ground cloth. So if you're in one of our shelters, that's floorless. Now you have that barrier. 
Mm-hmm. Um, if you get up in the morning, you take your multi cloth with you. Now it's in your pack. So if a sunshade, if rain comes in, now you got an emergency shelter gotcha. or to block block from you know the wind. Um, you know, or you know if you're lucky enough to harvest something, you lay that down, and you can uh, take your quarters and lay them on that multi cloth, so all of your quarters are clean. Mm-hmm. So. You, you start your gutless method, you put your first quarter on, you go all the way around and you come back to that first quarter. Once you're done, you know, cleaning the animal, it already has time to, you know, get rid of that initial heat. Because a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll start, you know, even I've seen it with skin on, you know, or hide on is where they're deboning, not deboning, excuse me, you know, gutless method and their buddy it's holding that quarter and they cut it loose and they go straight to a bag, mm-hmm. you know, well, one, there's, there's still hide on it. And two, it hasn't had its initial cool down and you're putting it into a bag. Now, granted, those bags are highly breathable, but you should put it straight on a multi cloth So it has nothing restricting it. Yeah. And, you know, but we've all cleaned up an animal by the time you're done with an elk, it's easily 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. So you have 45 minutes just call it where it's actually having a cool down stage where it's not trapped in a bag. So that's why we call it a multi cloth because there's multi uses for that cloth. Yeah, it's good. So no matter what, like if you're talking about quartering up your meat, um, adding an insulation layer, whether it's a thin cloth, uh, game bag or not, you're still adding insulation to that meat. Right. You know? It's not getting that yeah. cool down time. Yeah. You're, you're improving, that's, that's right. you're improving your quality you know, regardless of how much improvement is improvement, you know? Yeah. And so that, that's cool. Yep. I like that, that multi-cloth. And also, um, looking at these lightweight G threes, you know, I, my dad was in the military and when I was growing up, he had these, uh, they called them ponchos. A lot of guys call them woobies. You know, they're yep. like, they're like little, little, uh, little blankets, basically <laughs> like little, little military blankets. They poncho liner and put them on. I, I get yep. I get that feel when I see that I'm like I'm like man I'm surprised there's not a a, a six a.m. poncho liner on here that'd be kind of sick you know so if you look underneath the insulation tab so if you click on the shop tab and there'll be a drop down for insulation you'll see a throw mm-hmm. so it's not a it's not a wooby it's not a poncho it's it's just a throw mm-hmm. so there's different sizes you know the the primary one is you know, 48 by 60. Mm-hmm. Um, that's more for like a glassing blanket. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're at camp or you're at a ball game, you know, something around the house, you know, they're, they're smaller than a quilt, but that's what somebody would use. I would say the closest thing to a wooby, now, but we don't, we don't have a wooby or a poncho. Is the bottom of that, does that have DWR on it or, or coating or something? Yep. So with with most of our um, our quilts or the the throws, you choose the fabric. So if you want an interior specific, well, I, I advise that interior should be breathable. Mm-hmm. Um, if not, it's going to feel like you're in a trash sleeping in a trash bag. Um, but if you buy, let's say, a ready to ship one, they are always DWR on the outside and always breathable on the inside. So if you, if you sweat in the thing, you know, it's going to absorb into the, the sleeping bag a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, it would just pull up on you. And that's where that trash bag analogy comes from. Yeah, you don't want that sweat. You don't, be trapped. Yeah, you don't want that. Yeah, you don't want that. That's a pretty cool product. Yeah, that's awesome. That's another thing. I think that that's pretty awesome because, you know, just having something that's utility like that. You know, you can use it. If you want it to wrap up in it, you can. If you want to put it on the ground, you can. It's got the DWR. There's probably 10 different color options in camo you know so you know yeah they, you have a lot of offerings yeah. yeah we sell a bunch of quilts i mean a bunch of quilts mm-hmm. everybody everybody's getting the quilt idea um, from the through hike world mm-hmm. you know the hiker world it's it's been coming to the hunter world for several mm-hmm. years now um you know we've been making quilts since Oh, geez, I don't even know, 2010, 2012, something like that. Um, so we've been doing it for a bit. Uh, they're very modular, so they can be an underquilt, a top quilt, 
you know, a regular quilt, a blanket, like if you're going to a ball game or something, mm -hmm. you know, in town here, for example, the, the university opens up the football field where kids come out there and they watch, watch a movie. Well, we bring the quilts to that, you know, you lay it out like a blanket. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's got anchor points on all four corners. So it can be, you know, a top quilt or an under quilt. Um, the, the toe box, toe box or the foot box, it, it cinches up tight and it snaps all the way up to the back of your knee. Uh, then you got a draw cord on the shoulders to lock in the heat as well. And it's also offered in three different temp ratings. You know, it's going to be 30, 10 degree and zero degree. Um, and, and for that reason, you, you know why a 10 degree is because zero degree is cold, you know, and a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people say they are hardy, but zero degrees is cold. Yeah. So I hunted and, one and time thir in freaking single digits and that was the last time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And hunting, you're moving, mm -hmm. you know, but, but sleeping in a shelter and <laughs> you're stag you're stagnant. <laughs> I've been there. I've done that. Yeah. And Dave was just there this weekend. <laughs> it wasn't zero, but yeah. he was freezing his butt off. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you got a stove. Stoves are great, you know, but the burn time at most with great wood is like an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, you get crap wood in there. You're stoking it every half, half hour, 45 minutes, you know, but um 30 degrees a lot of people from the south they get 30 degrees um i get several people from like east coast you know not knowing what the west is like they get zero degree stuff and primarily people around the west side they get you know 10 degree because they know mm -hmm. and you know a lot of people ask a common question is is it comfort or an extreme rating and you know it's not it's not a comfort or an extreme. It's more the best way to answer it is, you know how you sleep. And that's how I tell people is if you're a cold sleeper, you know that you're a cold sleeper. And if you're a warm sleeper, you know, you're a warm sleeper. Me, for example, I know I am a cold sleeper. So if I'm in a traditional bag that says it's a 10 degree, I know I can't get that thing to 10 degrees just because it's naturally I'm a cold sleeper. Mm -hmm. So that's how ours are. So, it's more of a comfort rating, I would say, than an extreme, because an extreme, you know, you, you can do what you can to get through the night at an extreme level. But it's it's more of a comfort. So and I'll give you guys a real world example is I'm 6'3", 195 pounds, tall, skinny guy. I run a long quilt. Quilts are designed to go to your shoulders. So you save the weight from your head and you wear like a beanie or a hoodie. Mm -hmm. um, and they're 25% lighter because they don't have a backside. You utilize the insulation from your insulated pad uh, to heat up your backside. On a mummy bag, you're carrying around all that insulation, all that material just to lay on it. And when you're laying on that, you have no loft. And that's where you get insulation or your heat. So that's why a quilt doesn't have that. Um, I use a 10 degree. And once again, I'm a cold sleeper. So I know I can get to about 20 degrees. And in that scenario, if it's that cold, I'm going to have a wood stove. I always carry a stove if I know it's going to get to freezing, you know, 30 to 32 degrees. So I'm prepared if it starts to snow or stuff freezes, because if it freezes, I, I want to be able to drink water and not have to always melt water. Right. So, um, in that same scenario, my buddy who Adam, you know, he goes and he's a bigger guy. He's probably six foot, uh, maybe five eleven, seven eighths, but um <laughs> seven eights. He, he's yeah, right. He, he's a you bigger say, guy. He's five eleven point eight two five. Right. But but he's uh, he's a bigger guy. He's like two twenty, two twenty five. Um but he uses a 30 degree. So in the, in the same, same temps that I'm on. So whether it's early season, late season, he's just a warm sleeper. So here I am, I freeze my butt off and he's always sweating. So I, I would, I would just say that, you know, word of advice is you all know that if you're a warm or cold sleeper and that would determine what, what bag you go with. Um, 
So okay. it's it's not going to be different from one manufacturer to another, or I say it shouldn't be. We use Climate Shield Apex insulation, which is, you know, Marmot, North Face, you know, the big name brands. That's what they use as well. So we're we're creating same similar product, just a quilt rather than a a mummy bag. I'm instantly thinking about my daughter with this quilt too. You know, we go out yep. and we're sitting there. You know, she's this is her second year hunting, and um. You know, when we go out, it doesn't take long before she's like, Dad, is it always this cold? <laughs> it's like the middle of the day in October, you know, but for kids, yeah. they have a different tolerance. So I think I'm going to take one of those and just, you know, give it to her. Like, here, wear this, you know, put it on top. That way we can yeah. still sit there in glass and look. Yeah, and that's she's not perfect. Sitting for, there freezing, you know? Yeah, that's perfect for glass. And I know a lot of people that actually just like camp where they're going to be glassing so that they can just be in there either their bag or, or, um, quilt, <laughs> they don't, they just roll out and start glassing. It's pretty funny. Right. Yep. Yeah. If you're on a mule deer hunt, elk hunt, something like that, you gotta be, at least for me, you know, you're pretty mobile, but you know, I'm not a bear hunter, but the last year, so I've always had a bear tag, oh, but that's where I'm tag. more of a stagnant hunter. Right. You know, your, your example, you're camping, you're just glassing because there's, they're always active. If they're not active, they're snoozing in a tree. It's black gold, tight spot. Mm-hmm. You know, they all offer a lifetime warranty. Um, warranties are great, but then again, it still boils down to what's the what is the purpose of the business? And in six AM's world, purpose of the business is to stay made in the US and support, you know, the autonomy. You know, the U.S. worker, because if everybody went overseas, what's going to happen to all of us? And that's not what I want to do. Yeah. We kinda, so we lose that that craft of manufacturing. You know, for sure. There's a yeah. There's a, a guy I listen to. He has a podcast, and um, he started a company in Maine called Origin, and they uh, they make things. Um, but they make the textiles too. They, they, you know, they refurbish looms and um, they started making their own material. Now they have their own clothing line. It's all manufactured from, uh, I guess it comes in in raw form and they make the fabric, make the material, make everything here. So, you know, so, but you know, he was saying that, you know, th- take things overseas and makes, you know, other countries really good at sewing. But then over here, yeah. it's like, we're not really good at sewing, you know? So we have to yep. keep that skill and, you know, that's careers for people long term. Um, that's uh, self sustainability long term, and and more available as we've seen in the last year or two. Supply chain issues are huge, you know. So yep. you don't want to have that. Yep. And, you, know, I, you know, I think it's important to be self reliant, and you're doing all the right things, and I, I, you know, I support you in that. Yeah, and the big thing is, is like you mentioned, supply chain issues. Every company who's out there saying oh we've got a three-year wait well that tells you one thing is they're buying stuff from china yeah you know because because of tariffs tariffs are one you know when trump was in office he imposed a 25 percent increase in tariffs from china that was big and then you got the pandemic uh then you've got the panama canal then you've got you know every every shipyard the the freight is sitting out there for three months Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's because you're buying stuff from China. And you made a good point about textiles. You know, I buy most of my stuff from Kenyan Industries out of um, the Rhode Island. And they do a lot of uh, material for the, the United States Marine Corps or in that line, I'll just say the military. Um, I buy a lot of my stuff through them. But the problem that you get is you already hit the nail on the head is mills where are you going to get the manufacturing of the fabric the one place that does that is kenyan industries and if it gives you guys a price point the fabric for my game bags through kenyan industries and it's not the same it's like nine dollars a yard that's a yard you know so three feet Mm -hmm. yeah and and some of these game bags you know they've got six bags you could easily see, you know, depending on the size, you can easily see five yards, you know, because if you're looking at some of these items, uh, the game bags, let's say it's a 26 by 45, 
we don't do a seam on the bottom. So it's folded. So in reality, that's a 28 by 92 inch bag. Jeez. So you're got you, and that's just a flat piece of fabric, you know, so that's three yards just for that one, you know, or, you know, yeah, towards that set. Up quick. Yeah. Wow. And so if we think about a business model and, you know, it's full transparency, you know, that's $9 a yard, not including shipping, just raw goods. And then now, I mean, who wants to work to sew up and make a dollar for sewing a bag? Nobody in the States does, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I pay about, depending on the size of the bag, 5 to $7 to sew up a bag. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so, you know, click, quickly doing the math, I would not be in business purchasing uh, for $9 a yard. So uh, what I do is I get my antimicrobial fabric from Kenyan Industries. So they use that same fabric as their liner for, we've all seen their modular systems where it has like the four bags that go into one. Well, their interior liner is an antimicrobial gray, and that's what I buy for my antimicrobial bags. You know, all these other many competitors of mine are all their proprietary fabric. And I don't I don't mean to any disrespect to them, but it's not proprietary. You know, there is no patent on that fabric to say it's proprietary to them. They might have said it's proprietary because of the hue of the color, mm-hmm. but it's it's still generic fabric. Um, so that's why it's full transparency on my part is that it's it's straight from the mill over there. And that's what I make my antimicrobial game bags on. But that's just the antimicrobial line. So I do have to outsource my the hexagon fabric from to over from overseas because of the fact that nobody makes that fabric in the States. And yeah. if they did, you know, for the example, it's ten dollars a yard, if not more, because it's a higher um sought after fabric because it's a hexagon print Mm -hmm. rather than a a square grid and a square grid is just you know horizontal vertical lines so it's not as intricate as a hexagon print you know like a honeycomb does the so does the honeycomb print does that or the honeycomb construction does that give it extra stretch like multi-directional instead of two-way yeah it's not it's not a, a a stretchy fabric so, you know, you're used to, let's say, like a, a Kuyu or a First Light or a Merino where it has a stretch to it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have a, a, that stretch. So it would give you, you know, in, if you're grabbing it on a, hex, a, a square grid, you're going to have all the horizontal vertical lines. So if you're pulling to the left or right, you're pulling on those threads that are going, obviously, horizontal. Mm-hmm. Um, with a hexagon or the honeycomb print, you don't have that because they all intertwine or stack on each other. So you don't have those stress points. Yeah. It's way stronger. So Exactly. And nothing is wrong with traditional square ripstop. You know, they still make it. Everybody uses it today, but I thought of it. How can I make our product better? And that's what we came up with was hexagon. They had diamond. Mm-hmm. Diamond is another option. But once you start stacking diamonds on top of each other, you're going to get horizontal and vertical lines as, as well. It's more of a diagonal lines. Mm-hmm. But that's why we didn't go to diamond. So we went to the hexagon to have a stouter fabric. It's yeah. still the same 1.35 ounce breathable, or that some people call it pure finish. So there is no urethane. There is no DWR. It's just pure breathable fabric. That was um, I was surprised when I, a friend of mine works for Tory Industries and mm-hmm. or, and he works in composites, you know, in the States. Um, and so I was surprised when I looked on their website that they actually make, they have like this huge fabric line. So they make things for skiers, they make things for hikers and make, you know, whatever they want to sell you fabric wise, you can order from Tory. Um, and a lot of the things that people are saying, like they're saying, this, are, <clears throat> sorry, this is our proprietary stuff. It's actually Tory stuff. They're just 
buying that product from them. Right. You know, so it's already something that exists. It's a solution to skiing and they've applied it to something else or it's a, it's a solution made for hiking and then they apply it to something else. And, and that was a shocker to me. I was like, well, I thought this stuff was like intellectually protected, you know, but it's only intellectually right. protected to Tori. <laughs> so <laughs> Tori's knowing about it. So yeah, yep. there's a lot to know nope. about, about all these things and, and to find it fascinating that you put so much thought into that in the hexagon and, um, you know, just the little things, the small details, you know, those, those are what yeah. make things, you know, that little extra is from extra to extraordinary, you know? So it's kind of, yeah, it brings yeah, like, the quality out in the product. Yeah. And it's like, like I said, it's full transparent with you guys and listeners and everybody, you know, it's, if I could make a hundred percent very compliant product, I would do it. But the problem is a consumer wouldn't buy it. It'd because be cost, cost point would be super high. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You you know, I, I run Mystery Ranch backpacks. And the reason why I'm using them as an example is because they have military contracts where they have to be very compliant. Um, and they also have hunting and backpacks where they're made overseas. So you can compare apples to apples. But, you know, you can't do that with, with um, a Kafaru or an Exo or a Stone Glacier because they don't have the contracts. But if you look at Mystery Ranch, for example, or even their fire contracts, you know, their fire line, they got to be very compliant. Those packs are like twice the cost of an overseas one. Now, granted, they're probably padding their overseas one a little bit, you know, so they make more revenue. But they pay so much money for labor in the States, you know, because nobody wants to work for 10 bucks an hour. Yeah. and and it's it's the world. It's capitalism. That's what we're living in, right? And you you ain't going to have a good life working for ten bucks an hour. I think one so one perspective too is that nobody wants to pay seven. Oh, I guess I won't say seven, but nobody wants to pay fourteen hundred dollars for a pack. You know, that's right. If they that's if right. they were like, hey, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna just I'm gonna pay the money it takes to make sure that these things are made here. It may be a little bit more, but you know, I'm supporting my neighbor supporting the industry in different, you know, outlying areas in different states, but you're not, you're not giving the money away in order to save a dollar. That's right. You know, so and the, the desire of people to save money, you know, to buy their espresso or whatever they do with it, it could be spent on something else that would help actually, you know, make more production here and help us to be better, uh, I guess, craftsmen in whatever trade you're doing. Right. And that's where, you know, I had the, the decision to make is, do I not make game bags because I wouldn't stay afloat doing them? I would be losing money or I charge people a ridiculous amount of money to have this stuff made in the States, very compliant. Well, nobody would buy them. They would go buy other cheaper stuff that's on clearance, right? Mm -hmm. Or a, a discounted rate. So that's where I was in a predicament. It was like, okay, well, I can get this fabric for you know, almost l half the cost of what I can get in the States, but I can still make them in the States, support American workers, still have a lifetime warranty on it. So I do understand that it's an overseas fabric, but there really is not any mills in the States. The only ones are on the East Coast, and they're primarily making military stuff because if you're making military stuff, you got to be very compliant. So the fabric has to be from the States. That's why it's so expensive. Yeah, that's, so, <clears throat> that's what I found too, um, listening to that, that other podcast, because um, I didn't yeah. know that they didn't have looms here. Like they, they just were, if you wanted to get something made, there just wasn't anybody to make it. And right. you know, they actually refurbished uh, a super old loom. Apparently it was in a, a ma old manufacturing warehouse. They had located it and they had to ship it out, but they got it for free. And then they refurbished that, that loom. And there's a whole story that goes with it, but they've now they're up to like six or seven looms and they're making their what own podcast. Stuff. Is that Jocko? Jocko podcast. Yeah. He's talking about that. And so, um, yeah, he, he started the origin company, you know, they, him so. and camp cam, I think cam Haynes, I think is a part of that too. Yeah. So they have a, they have their own company that does that, um, manufacturing of the, of the material, uh, manufacturing that material into a product and then they sell it and you can, you can buy stuff that's a hundred percent made in the United States. And I think they even require that the, the, uh, the, whatever they make the fabric out of is grown here, the cotton and stuff. Yep. 
you know so yeah it's very interesting man i i'm you know this is a long um process and uh you're doing everything you can do you know i know a lot of guys that make things in in the states and you know you're limited in certain aspects of what you're capable of doing but you're doing everything you can do to to support us here and we appreciate it yeah definitely yeah that and that's exactly what i'm trying to do and you know i i've got so many retailers that are knocking at my door but it boils down to production you know so i don't have the production bandwidth i've got contract sewers in washington that are doing my mass produce items um, i'm looking at getting more uh contract sewers um they're they're out of, i'm talking so to some ones in minnesota and ones in illinois so they're still within the states but reaching out to more because you guys know in seattle area it's just super expensive yep. and it, it's just it's getting so out of control you know you know not talking politics bringing it in but you know it's just getting the, the labor shortage or and, and or demand is getting so out of control that it's it's going to be unbearable and that's where i'm trying to be a ahead of the curve and getting another sewer lined up where i don't see a hiccup because i'm getting forced to, to pay more for these bags to get done because of the labor issue in seattle yeah. so I, i'm i'm being proactive getting that and so that way i can get um more of the product into some retailers you know because right now it's in black ovis you know solo hunter he's got it um it's in archery shops you know primarily around uh montana botech chasm um so there's a lot of shops that carry it um there's a lot more that are on that are you know like i said knocking at my door but i have to be selective because i need to make sure that i can still feed my current list, not the ones that are coming on. So once I get um, my sewers lined up, then we'll be able to be into other uh, retail locations. Because a lot of people ask me, well, where can I see it? Well, if you're at a local pro shop, you in you know generally the Montana area, you can see it. But if you're in California or Idaho or even Washington, you know, you you can't see the product. So yeah that's what we're trying that that's the next business goal is to get production uh in queue lined up ready to rock and roll so uh they'll be at a pro shop near you nice well tristan we have one listener question that we want to get to um and the question is can you put a floor in any of the shelters and the question was because ticks are bad (laughs) <laughs> during the springtime. <laughs> so we went out. This isn't from us. This is from a buddy of ours. We were out you know, turkey hunting in the springtime. And if, you know, someone happens to get a spring bear tag in Idaho or Montana or whatnot, you know, ticks are extremely bad during the spring. And can they put a floor in the floorless shelters from 6 a.m.? Sure. So when we first <laughs> sure. started like doing this, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll give you the rundown on it. So when we first started doing this, we were smaller scale. So we did a lot more custom stuff. And there might be listeners out there or other people that have sewn in floors uh, on their shelter from us. Um, the problem that happens is you have to sew it. It comes back down to you know production time and lead time because if somebody wants one with a floor i can't sell them one without a floor i have and i can't cut off the bottom of that's already finished i would have to start from scratch and i don't know who wants a floor and who doesn't right so, so it'd be a full custom deal yeah and they and, have to account for lead time that's right so they could sew one in we could sew one in but it, it just takes up a lot of time because everything has to stop of what they're doing and go back to that one shelter and so a foreign. Not a problem if we're not during the busy season. Right. Um, what we what we started to steer towards because business is much bigger than it was back then 
is we're we're going towards um, removable floors. So, so like a it tub. is not. It's like a footprint. So it's that's, not that's air. Easy. It's not airtight. I'm sorry. That makes it a lot easier. Yeah, it might not be airtight, but it's going to get you out of the bugs. Yeah, and and the reason why it's so much easier is because I already have a. When we design the shelter, we have the typical dimensions, right? Uh, now, granted, if you've got a shelter, let's say the four corners that you want wider and you're going to sacrifice height, you can do that because you just stretch out the, the, the sidewalls further. But um, if you do get a floor, it has preset dimensions, obviously, because it's a footprint that has the stake points all the way around. Yes. So it makes set up, set up a breeze because you just stake your floor down and then your shelter actually hooks to the same stakes as your footprint. Um, but it is not 100% airtight. Um, if you stake it down properly, you know, they do overlap and they do create somewhat of a seal. But like I said, it's not airtight like a traditional freestanding shelter is or a, a tent is. Um, and I, and to talk about, you know, teepees in, in that aspect is, you know, the other shelters like the, bat, um, the mat, uh, not the Madison, sorry, the four corners, the Bitterroot and the CC, they all can have a three quarter floor because the stove is towards the front. So that way, when you have a stove set up, it's not on a floor that you can catch a spark that would result into burning the floor up, which would be hurting you and burning everything down. Yeah. So it's a, a liability issue with putting a floor in a teepee because the teepee is towards the front. Um, I know, you know, we've talked about it, about having a stove offset, um, yeah. you know, more, more towards a wall, but then again, you're sacrificing livable space in that shelter because you're going to have a pole in the center and then you don't want to have a stove kicked off a bit. Um, and then you're going to have, yeah, uh, you the just embers. turned, you just turned your four person shelter to a three person shelter. That's, that's right. And, and then you're going to have the ember aspect. So it's easier to put that stove in the center and have that stove pipe up out of the way of the, um, the, the peak of that shelter. So if you have it on the offset, you know, and let's say the wind starts blowing, now you're actually fighting that pull because that stove is that stove pipe is going to be pulling on the shelter a little bit. And then your embers are more likely to, to potentially burn holes in your shelter easier because it could travel much further distance, you know, all the way across the shelter rather than halfway across the shelter. So it's just become more of a hassle to put uh, a floor in. Um, we we tinkered around with the idea of like a half floor. So if you think of the the teepee where it's a front entrance, you would walk in and you would have half of a floor on one side. And you know, granted, you can't have four people sleeping in it because it'll only be half of it. So, no, but I think if you, you were to have, have, if you were to have that option, someone would already know that that's what they're getting into. That's right. Like, yes, I do have this four person TP tent, but I only have it really for two people, but I have the area for putting, you know, our boots and bags and, you know, whatever on the other side. And I can still have this hot tent, you know, I can still run this stove with, you know, no problem. Yeah, and the problem that I would run into, and I just got to think of the business side, is if somebody orders a teepee and then they added a stove and they add two half floors, right? So now I'm back at square one where they've got a floor inside of a shelter. Yeah, you so got to protect the that, consumer from themselves sometimes, you know. Yeah. Ex exactly, right? Yeah. We've all heard the story of people who put their RV on cruise control and think it's autopilot. <laughs> actually i haven't why don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that, that was, was that funny. was probably back in late 80s early 90s when auto or cruise control first started coming out oh gotcha yeah man That's people goofy. people wrecked them and they had lawsuits 
no different than uh, people suing gun manufacturers for killings, right? Oh, or mass they, shootings. They that's, turned into a building because a GPS told them to make a left, you know? It's like, what that, the heck? That, <laughs> yeah, that, what? That's right. <laughs> yep. You got to protect so, the consumer. Yep. Exactly. And so that's why we really haven't done it. I mean, we do we do recommend, let's say you add a multi-cloth, or if that multi-cloth says it's a four by six, isn't big enough for, a, let's say that Madison, which is nine and a half foot, you know, walls, we can make a custom size, you know, cause we do make custom products. You know, if anybody has a custom idea that they want, um, you know, we can make them. And, you know, for example, I was on uh, a hunt, you know, literally on a hunt, my buddy tagged out on an elk, we're packing them out and a guy called and you know, as a small business owner, you got to answer your phone. I mean, typically on a hunt, I don't, but since I wasn't hunting and he was already done, I answered the phone. It was a guy from Colorado and he had a, uh, an idea on a shelter and we started talking and now we're, we're making that shelter and we potentially are going to come out with it as a, um, a, a new shelter design. You know, obviously he's okay with it because it's a pretty simple design, but that's a new, new idea that's coming out. So we do do custom stuff. So if something comes out for the example, like that multi-cloth, it's not big enough. We'll make a bigger one. Use sinister dimensions. Um, or like a shelter like that, that gentleman did, you know, we do that as well. So, yeah. Nice. Well, it sounds like it's pretty simple as long as we don't make things complicated with the, with the, with the tents, you know, <laughs> you know, so yeah. you, you stake the corners, put the pole, you're pretty much ready to go. If you want to put down a, a floor in it. You can do it to the stakes of the same size or put a, what is it? Uh, a multi-cloth down. So, yep. Yeah, yeah, I think you you got you got a good thing going here, I, and in that um, you know it's nice that it's made in the United States and lifetime warranty. You know, can't beat that. Yeah, two percent right. conf- uh, conservation. I mean, well, yeah. that's awesome too. You had this two percent for conservation on your website. What's that? What's that about? And where are you sending the money? So two, so two percent for conservation is um, a gentleman started it out here in. Uh, he says Bozeman, but it's actually Belgrade. It's actually a bunch of companies that donate 1% of their sales and 1% of their time. So that's where they get 2% from. Mm-hmm. So for us, we donate to almost every org that we can. Um, there's Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Um, and there's a lot of heat going on with backcountry hunters and anglers. TRCP, yep. um, you know, not allocated money properly. Um, we still donate, you know, it's not to as much as we did in the past because of those allegations, you know, it's not proven. So they are considered innocent until proven guilty. But, um, you know, we do Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance, Wild Sheep Foundation, SCI, um, we do Ducks Unlimited. So even if I can't attend an event, um, I, I donate. So we did uh, an Elk Foundation banquet last year that was up in Helena. We we bought a table that was 2000 bucks that we donated. Um, oh, nice. Ducks Unlimited was in Hagerman, Idaho. Uh, I didn't make it to that one, but that was, I believe it was an $800 table. Um, you know, so I, I try to donate as much as possible. It's clearly well over my 1% of the revenue that what we make. Um, and, you know, if I don't do a table, you know, I'll do, you know, their, their yearly membership um, or, you know, some of the team members on 6 a.m., I buy them memberships, you know, so everybody gets uh, an Elk Foundation or a Ducks Unlimited um, membership. Uh, so, so those are some of the organizations that we do. Um, and then the 1% for your time is actually, you're, you're putting in effort, you know, some people like FHF that's in Bozeman here, they do like a river cleanup. Uh, I know Tony from dark timber, he does that as well. Or if you're going to go on a hiking trail, like what we've done in the past, you, you donate your time to clean up the trails for conservation or the outdoors. Um, there was a big event down here in in, in the Gallatin Valley here, they're actually trying to purchase some land um, for um, hang gliders. 
and they were actually going to be taking out a huge chunk of elk um, habitat, you know, to put in this trail for these these paragliders, hang gliders. So we were in there advocating our time, you know, to we were, you know we were opposed to that, mm-hmm. you know, because you obviously don't you don't want the elk foundation to save um, habitat, but yet again behind them, you, you know, the uh, Gallatin Valley is giving up their habitat, you know, for these hang gliders. So, you know, we, we fought a lot of our time towards that. Um, you guys got a regular, the years, old, regular old Yellowstone event going on over with them hang gliders. <laughs> <laughs> right. Get yeah. ready, boys. Well, Time to call in cattle patrol. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that was last year. But the year, um, well, it was last year, too. So, yeah, it was a busy year. But there's so many house bills that were trying to get passed that they're trying to, to demolish our elk herds out here. Um, we spent a lot of time up in Helena, you know, at the Capitol um, on some of their hearings and, you know, their protests and stuff, um, you know, to, to save the elk because there's, we're spending so much time, energy, money to reintroduce elk. And Montana has a lot, a lot, a lot of public land, but yet the congressmen, you know, they're trying to literally wipe out the elk herds. You know, you've got wolves running rampant. You've got grizzly bears, you know, killing people and, and, and elk as well. But then they've also got congressmen who don't even elk hunt that are trying to offer six points um, to non-residents to harvest cows. Uh, I, I want to if I remember correctly, it was three points for a non-resident to, to harvest a cow. And you can shoot two a year. So they're... Um, solution was to have them do that which they get six points that would take me six years of applying and not being successful so if a non-resident does that for two years they got 12 bonus points for a limited entry tag which would take a resident 12 years to do you know and it's totally not fair because you know every non-resident is going to come in for 250 bucks to shoot a cow um, you know to get three bonus points which would take three years to do and you can do that up to two times a year you're spending what 500 bucks for six points yeah you know it's and crazy. yeah and you know this last year uh, shoulder season i don't really hunt shoulder season and a shoulder season if people don't know it opens up from the end of november which when general season ends till most places are january 15th if not february 15th so you're hunting elk and that shoulder season starts august 15th till january 4th so you can really hunt elk from August fifteenth till February fifteenth. You said these tags so, are two fifty. <laughs> <laughs> right now, now granted, there's, <laughs> now granted, there's stipulations. It's only <laughs> cow, cow per cow hunts at that time yeah. is a shoulder season, not not a bull. Yeah. But the thing is, is when are the elk getting a break? You know, people are out there scouting in July, right? Then you got people, there was a guy who just got mauled in Yellowstone because he was, well, it was north of Yellowstone, but he got mauled by a grizzly bear because he was shed hunting in, I think that was end of March. The elk haven't even lost their antlers yet. And here he is shed hunting, looking for these antlers, and he got mauled. And so a lot of people are out shed hunting now. So if they're hunting now, let's, let's just call it the end of April, May, and you were just hunting them in February, you got, they got a two month break and you know, they just come out of winter. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of controversy going on where these elk are just getting pushed around in reality all year round, you know, because they don't have a break because they're hunted in December and January and February. Well, that's when they're fighting winter and Montana winters aren't nice. Um, you know, we had negative 20, um, for like two, two weeks. Now, granted they're an animal, they're used to it, but maybe not used to negative 20, you know? And then once you see, once you see snow that's burying all your feet and you got to fight for it, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of animals come suspect to wolves. That's (laughs) that they're not, you know, trying to actively manage. I mean, they did make some progress. Uh, you can now hunt wolves over bait, and you can now hunt wolves um, with night vision and at nighttime. Damn. So, <laughs> yeah, 
that, my that that's <laughs> yeah. So they're they're starting to, but then again, they're still allowing elk to be. I, I won't say hunted, but pressured all year. So it's it's very sore subjects, and that's why we spent a lot of time up at Helena because there were people um, coming up with these ideas that they thought were great for their pocketbook, but not for the residents or non-residents that are hunters. Yeah, in so, long long term, it's not sustainable at that pace. You know, all those pressures. No, and I. Um, that's right. I think how I can best relate this is, is like, uh, I used to have a boat and when you operate a boat, it's not like driving a car. Like most people think, Oh, I can drive this boat cause I can drive a car and you get in a boat and you have external forces that you don't recognize. And so you give it some throttle to the left. You have to give it like twice as much throttle to the right to counteract the motion in the inertia in the water. So a lot of people don't realize like a little adjustment goes a long way. So if you overcorrect one direction, then it takes twice as much force to get back to where you were. So, yep. you know, people that don't understand that concept, you know, sometimes you get into this thing with wolves and then you get into it with these shorter seasons and then you get into, you know, shed hunting. And sometimes you just have to say, hey, let's just start small. Let's not go, sure, bring on whatever you got to bring on. Yeah, let's do this. Let's do that. Yes, yes, yes. And then all of a sudden you're like, crap, how do we? How do we make the adjustments back to where everything's going to be sustainable? You have um, less impact on animals when they need to reserve energy, you know, because, you know, every animal faces winter and, um, you know, it, it's, that's the toughest time of the year for them regardless. And a lot of them are, you know, they have, they're pregnant or they're going to be calving soon or bonding soon or whatever. But um, yeah, it's just a tough time for them. So they got to figure out how to, you know, make those adjustments whatever they do less impactful so they can calibrate and say, what's the impact instead of going so far. And then, then they have a giant impact and like, wow, you know, now we really need to make some more drastic measures. And so, yeah, you guys are doing good by, right. by fighting those, those forces and, you know, help, help people understand, you know, there's, there's more at stake than just, you know, making some people happy because you have to consider first the the animals and then you go to, you know, okay, now what's the recreational access going to be? Because this has to be sustainable and they have to manage the populations, you know, for that, for those reasons, for one, for the animal two, if you're going to offer opportunities, those have to be gauged based on the animal's um, stability, you know? Yep. And that's, that's the predicament, you know, these Western states are in, you know, we all know about the grizzly bears. I mean, I'm, I'm 45 minutes from Yellowstone. I hear about grizzly maulings and not just maulings, but deaths like a dozen times a year because it's literally almost in my backyard, but they are a predator as well. Right? So if we're worried about wolves and we got to manage them, what about grizzly bears? You know, I, I don't want to open up that can of worms, but they can't be on an endangered species list that are reproducing, you know, exponentially. And they're still on an endangered species list. Yeah, um, got to calibrate. You know, they got to calibrate and adjust. You know. Yeah, I mean, I don't all. know. Yeah, I don't know the amount that we have in Montana, but if they're coming out, one uh, two years ago, there was three maulings on one one road in Ennis, and if you have three people that are getting mauled and dying because of grizzly bear attacks, when is it enough enough? You know, and I understand that they deserve to, to be around just as much as we do. But what happens if we go out and kill three people? You know, you're going to go to jail and you're going to be in a <laughs> silo. Yeah, right. but, exactly. but, but, you know, they need to be managed as well. And no different than a bison tag, right? Mm -hmm. Very few are given. If we've got a hundred, a hundred freaking grizzly bears in Montana alone, just per se, you can easily give away 10, 10 permits to kill 10 bears. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not going to impact the, the, the statistics or the, the reproduction of grizzly bears. Um, you know, because that's just Montana. You got Wyoming, you got Colorado and Idaho and so forth. You know, they all can do their own, but for them to get away and say, we're not going to do anything and they're just going to continue to reproduce. Look at bears like, I don't even know her number, 399, I think it is, out of Yellowstone. She's got four cubs. 
you know, and it, it's it's the late, latest thing since sli- sliced bread, and everybody wants to stare at this bear that's got four cubs, and now they're worried about them because they're going to go to civilization. Well, what's going to happen when they go to civilization? Yeah, we all we all we all know that outcome. It's like Godzilla going to Tokyo, man. <laughs> that's <laughs> bad news. Well. They they do that, or they're going to like what they do in Montana. Here is they capture them and they dump them off in a wilderness area where people hunt, and that's where the attacks come, and then people die. Yeah. So they don't want to kill a bear. They're going to reintroduce them to another area, and that's where humans are going to get you know their lives taken. Well, they introduce um, them to an area where people don't expect to see a bear. You know, you're like, hey, there's yep. no grizzly bears over here. Ah, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, surprise, and that's. And that's just like Washington, you know, like your guys' spring bear season this year, right? Yeah. Um, it, it got hammered or axed because I, I don't know the hundred percent. You guys might be able to correct me on this, but maybe a lot of the the people of the state didn't speak up, and more or less, people who didn't know the knowledge on it um, didn't speak up. And I know that it was um, it was a, a second vote correct and it, it they didn't actually the state didn't actually listen to the the biologists that yeah. were supporting it yeah and that's exactly what it was too so it was basically based off of um non-hunters opinions and they did not listen to the biologists or even the the hunters in general um it, 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 it was ridiculous. It it was absolutely yeah. ridiculous. And, and it shows that, you know, Washington was actually in the wrong because the ne- very next month it was up in California and California, you know, they passed it. Yeah. Or they, excuse they, me, they, they allowed it. Yeah. Yeah. They, they still now have a black bear hunt. They, they said, you know what, we're going to go off of the science and that's how it's going to be regardless of, yeah. you know, someone else's opinion saying that the science is not accurate and all this other stuff. Um, but that's the right. science that we have. So that's the science that we have to go off of. And California did it, did it right. So hopefully, you know, yeah. next year, if this does come back on a vote for Washington state, they get their heads out of their asses. Yeah. It can't be emotionally yeah. driven. You know, it, it, this is, you're talking about literally, literally life and death and of animals or people in, in a lot of these, um, uh, wildlife management so you, you you can't make emotional decisions when it comes to wildlife management and i think a yep. lot of people at this point in time they're, they're you know they've they've been raised on disney and you know they just think that these things just walk around joyfully and yeah you can go <laughs> give them a hug yeah it's a they're, wild freaking animal will rip your face yeah clean off and not even think twice about it when you see videos on on uh social media platforms on reels and stuff where Someone's walking up to a buffalo. I think last week someone was walking to a buffalo. Is in Yellowstone, probably an older video. Yep. But it started to charge him, and the two people thought they could outrun this buffalo, and it was barely walking, and it ran him down. You know, and the the lady, you know, gratefully she didn't get trampled, but she got she got hooked pretty good and thrown. You know, so. Um, but yeah, you got to be careful, and you got to make sure that you know we're we're watching over that, and the bio just make sure that they're doing their job, and people's emotions aren't in the picture. And all that. Well, stuff that's that, that. That's the biggest thing. Like you stated, they're doing their job. You know, you don't you don't go into an accounting office to say, "Hey, you did this wrong." When you're talking to a CPA, right? You know, you don't go into a baker and say, "Yeah, you you baked this cake wrong." When you don't even know how to bake a cake. Yeah. And that's where I. <laughs> that's where I. That's where I find it hard to believe where the state made the decision to ax the spring bear hunt when they're paying, they're actively paying biologists for this, yeah. you know, and, and that's the hard part. But then again, we saw, and I, I don't want anybody to take offense to it, but then again, we saw the the mayor of Seattle backstab their chief of police and let the Chaz or chop group go in. Right. Yeah. So yeah, total emotion it, decisions, you know, that's exactly it, you know, and they don't want to upset the people of the city when you've got, what is it? 3 million people in the greater Seattle area. Um, Something. And, and it's King, ridiculous and, amount of people. And King County is the voting um, county for the whole state. 
you know so i don't know like i said i don't i don't like talking politics because everybody obviously is entitled to their own opinion but uh, uh, this is a perfect example where you know it shouldn't have happened um but it's unfortunate yeah yeah so all right but anywho all right tristan well hey you know here at the ridgeline hunting podcast we definitely support 6 a.m outdoors and uh for the listeners out there where can they um you know purchase the products reach out to you if they they have a question um you know what what are some of the platforms that people can get to you and and talk to you sure so we're on instagram and it's 6 a.m but it's not the number six it's v-i-a-m so it's roman numerals um outdoors so we're on instagram we're on facebook um you've got my phone number on there and if you guys don't want to look it up my number is 406-823-9023 give me a call i've got it's my business phone personal phone i always answer it um and i actually had a guy I called a guy back last two nights ago i was at softball practice and i got out at eight o'clock and he's like holy cow i never expected you to call me i'm like that's that's what i do <laughs> you know so um yeah, you can reach out to me there. You know, if you got questions, comments, concerns, you can, you know, message us on Facebook or Instagram. I do have a guy who uh, runs the social platforms for me. Um, I have access to them. I see them. So if there is a specific question that is answered, um, I'll get notified and then I will be the one answering it. Um, but, you know, if it's a generic response, like, um, you know, winter game eggs and being stock or whatever, it it would probably be the other guy. But if it's a specific question to the company, then it would be myself. Or or feel free to give me a call. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you being on. Conversation was highly intellectual, and we learned a lot. I mean, I I mean, I didn't even know there was buffalo in Alaska. <laughs> to be honest with you, I didn't either. That so I was like, I, yeah, I was blown away. Like, what, really? You well, if you guys want, everything. if you <laughs> if you guys want a good read, um, when when we found out Adam drew that tag, it was a, a lot of people recommended a book called American Buffalo by Stephen Ranella because he actually drew a tag up in Alaska, and that's where I learned all this stuff from. All the bison came from Montana at the National Bison Range that's just north of Missoula, so it's 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 pretty cool. And you know, like I said, they. They transplanted them up there three times, and the first two they didn't stick. And and now the Delta herd is about 600, and I think they transferred 60 of them up there altogether, and it's now about 600. Wow, wow. that's amazing. And that was that was in like I want to say it was the mid 1920s is when they they transferred them up there. But that that that's a good book for you know you guys or your listeners. It's it's a it's a great book. You know everybody likes to read the Cam Haynes books, which are great. But that was a, a good book for reading as well. Awesome. Well, we appreciate it. We'll check out the book and, you, and uh, maybe someday we'll be in the Delta. <laughs> that's it. Keep your fingers crossed. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right. Well, all right, everybody. All right. That is going to be a wrap for tonight. Please like, subscribe, you know, do whatever you can to, uh, you know, support our podcast. But everybody have a good night and thank you.